afternoon. I'm one of the founding members of the Blue Mountain Education Research Trust, founded by this fellow here, Father Eugene, um, the doyen of this afternoon's proceedings. Uh, we'll begin by uh, a welcome to country, and I'd ask Taylor Clark to come forward and do the welcome. Thanks, Taylor. Yarangi, Yangupora, Mandugini, Garangara, Nunangula, Maran, Garahi, Kuletangboro. Thank you. On behalf of my people, we welcome you onto Gandangara lands. Thank you and have a lovely day. I'd just like to say a few words before we get going with the launch. My name's Taylor Clark and I'm a proud Gandangara woman. My people are the Bijuang people of the Baragurang Valley, which is what this book's written about. I would like to thank uh, Kel especially for inviting me to speak today um, and I'd like to thank all of the con contributors for this book. It's truly an amazing work of literature and I can't wait for you all to hear about it and to read it and to experience the valley through the words of these amazing people. There's so many inspiring people in the room today and I can't wait to talk to everybody but um, I'd like to make a specific note of Jim Smith um, who since I was a really little girl has taken me out onto country um, when in a lot of ways I haven't had anyone else to teach me uh, the stories and the trails through Baragarang Valley. He's had to contend with my terrible sense of direction and my work schedule and all the rest of it and has just really persevered and has shaped me into what I hope um, is a, a better woman and a better Gandangara woman because I understand how I fit into the story. But I've got so much to learn and um, I've got more to learn even reading this book. So I hope you guys can come on that journey with me. Um, we really believe in coming together like this, that everyone is welcome into the circle to share their stories and knowledge so that we may learn from one another and grow as a community. Everyone is welcome and everyone with respect and an open heart has a place and can have a voice with us. We cannot move forward as a people if we, not, we are not willing to do this. I'd like to welcome you into the circle with us today. My great-grandfather's great-grandfather, George Riley, was a very strong Aboriginal man. He was known to have said, Garabianga Yinga Go, which means halt, defend yourself, stand. This was his call to his warriors to be ready with their spears to defend our home and their families against invaders to country. In the 1950s, the people of Baragarang Valley were forcibly removed to leave their home and to make way for the construction of Warragamba Dam. They were given no choice. The land was reacquired by the government, the land cleared, and their home flooded. We will never know the extent of what was lost when the dam was constructed. The flooding of the valley saw the inundation of 11 waterholes sacred to our dreaming story. Beneath the water today are burial sites, women's and men's places, shelters, meeting places, and the remnants of the Bargarang settlement. Now, if I can talk about something that's very important to me and something I hope you can all think about as you're reading this book, that area is threatened again. The New South Wales government want to raise Warragamba Dam Wall by 14 metres, which will have a devastating impact on yet more of this beautiful country. It threatens endangered species, but it also threatens more of our sacred places, two more of the waterholes sacred to the Gurungach and Mirrigan story. Our stories are the backbone of culture. They ground us and help us find how we fit into the world by showing us how things came to be and to see how it all fits together and how we fit into the story. It is important for us to be able to follow the song lines when we tell our stories. If we can't do this, we will be lost. I would say that I've been very lucky to have had this opportunity, although I really think luck should have nothing to do with it. When the dam was made, our people scattered across New South Wales, taking with them memories, records, photographs, stories, and knowledge of so many places. Our work and the work of people like those who've written this book today has been to pull all that back together. 
to put the bits of the story back together and discover the documents and the hidden places that have been lost to find the valley again. We still have so far to go. And if the wall is risen, we will never put that story back together again. We do not own the land. The land owns us. We come from Mother Earth. Garabianga, Yingago. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. There was a great deal of spirit behind that. Just, just one little word I'd offer about this building that we're in. This is the core of this building is actually from a 1903 church that was up near Ridge Street, and uh, it was moved down here, became a school hall, and it's been added to, of course, over the years. And um, Eugene would know his own time in this as a schoolboy and back when. Um, so just a little bit of background on that. And Eugene is the founder, or the founding inspiration of the Blue Mountain, not Blue Mountains, the Blue Mountain, Lawson is the original Blue Mountain um, Education and Research Trust. Uh, the Trust sponsors research and publishing and supports the Greater Blue Mountains Aboriginal Studies Forum. Ten years ago we published Blue Mountain Dreaming, which has become a classic um, in demand in overseas libraries who, you know, where scholars have taken an interest in uh, Aboriginal culture. And the book we're launching today, Aboriginal Heritage of the Blue Mountains, is really a sequel in lots of ways to that original publication. Uh, just in a moment, I'm going to ask Wayne to come and speak uh, with reference to Reverend Dr Eugene. Uh, Wayne's a specialist in rock art and engravings, and of course he's got a chapter in this book. <coughs> the work of the Trust and its publications owe their existence to the inspiration and the energy of Eugene. Um, Eugene's one of those wonderful people who can, say, ring any one of us up on the Trust with a scheme. He's a scheming devil, and then passes the scheme on and, and we get to work on it. And, so he's, he's got great inspiration and uh, great energy. So Wayne, would you step forward and um, offer us a few words on this grand man? Yaman, which is now Gamori language means, hello good friends. Um, I just want to acknowledge the Darug and the Gandangara um, have been here for thousands of years and are still here and strong. And I um, also want to honour the fellow authors. Um, you know who you are. Um, it's been a, a long, hard slog to get this book out. And um, the people that uh, have contributed to this book are also people that I respect a lot. And um, Eugene, well, <laughs> He's been a big part of my life and a, and a great mentor. And um, I've had a few good mentors, and particularly with my um, Gamaroi uh, fellows. And um, I used to always ask them, um, what can I do to pay you back? And they would say, just be a good mentor yourself. <clears throat> and so um, that's where I'm at. And I'm, I'm part of this wonderful community up here, even though I'm not living here at the moment. I've, sort of been living in cars and hotels it seems like, but um, I'm back here again and it always feels good to come back here. Eugene of course uh, is well known for his um, archaeology but there's other many sides. He's, he's like a multi-platform core, <laughs> one would say. Many different faces and uh, many different fragments that have come off and excited so many people and I am one of those. Together with Val Atra here today these two people have inspired me to keep going in archaeology and I really appreciate their guidance and their support as I do my wonderful community up here. Eugene's also worked in the Middle East and uh, he's done a, a tremendous amount of work here in the Blue Mountains too. And that's how I came into meeting Eugene, is that uh, I came back from America after studying there in, in the 70s and ended up at Mount Wilson in 1979. And, started researching and documenting rock art. And um, 
there was always this man, Eugene Stockton, his books and his work would always appear. And I said, I have to meet this man. And he, at the time, I think he was going between the Manly Seminary, uh, Seminary and uh, Garfield Road at Riverstone. I think that's when we tied up. And um, I think I, I called him that was in the old-fashioned days. We didn't have emails or anything like that. And uh, he wrote me a letter. He wrote me a beautiful letter. And he wrote me several over the times I've known him. And, and um, it inspired me to look at his work and particularly his large body of work of the excavations that he'd done in the Blue Mountains. Um, and then um, I was up in the Selwyn Ranges in the 90s working with Dr Ian Davidson uh, on some of the rock art up there. And Steve Sutton, who was also part of that, said, oh, I've got a surprise for you, Wayne. There's someone coming out to meet you. And I didn't know who it was. And so we were a pretty rugged area and pretty wild and this land cruiser pulls up after a 20 hour journey. I can't remember how far it was, but it was a long way. And out bobbles out the back is Eugene <laughs> with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. <laughs> and he was up there and it was hard work. We were actually recording and excavating a couple of sites up there. This is the early 90s with the University of New England. And um, we just had some fascinating talks sitting in the, in the dry riverbed there and Eugene was just chewing on the Devon sandwich or whatever it was we had and uh, he just came out with these incredible things you know um, you know his articles are you know just fantastic works like his classic article on Treadage still today gets cited and quoted um, and some, you know he just was a, a pioneer and people don't realize how much effect and maybe Eugene doesn't but he's had an effect on a large amount of people um, so this book is really a testament to the many ways uh, of how Eugene brings researchers together. And he is, he's cunning, he's very cunning. <laughs> and you have to be, to a certain extent. Um, you know, some of the things, it's just the little things that he would say to me, just some of the one-liners, like, um, just, they're just so simple, like, and it's in his book there, it says, like, uh, um, picking up a, a stone artifact is like shaking hands with the past. Beautiful, just so beautifully captured. Um, there are stone tools that fit in the hand and there's one that fits in the fingers. And I just went, how profound, of course. And stone tools are tools for making other tools, of course. And what really got me, importantly, um, was one of the things that I actually uh, quote in my book is, is talking about liminality and the mundane and how they actually operate at the same time and punctuated by ceremony. And when he said that to me, I went, yes, that just encapsulates it in one sentence. So in my writing, because I've had a, a larger version of writing, because from Montgomery tradition, we're oral tradition and story, song and dance. And so I pushed through that and I must thank these two people here and sitting on my left hand side and particularly Eugene, who encouraged me to get this across the line, and it's just whether my appetite enough now to continue with this work. And I think that's really important we need to acknowledge the support. You know, we have a saying that I walk beside you, I don't walk in front of you or behind you. And one day we may have to stand back to back to protect our sacred fire. So we need to work together. And to me, this is a seminal moment, not only because this is my first solo publication in the sense of a chapter but also it marks the fact that we are willing to work together. So important. So it's a kumpa too, fresh start for us all. And <clears throat> one of the other things which is, um, you know, really important, um, I think one of the most important he, he, I heard him say, or I think it might have been in his book, um, uh, uh, Deep Within, um, and he said the gathering knowledge uh, sometimes it, it can be we can lose wisdom at, at that expense, and and that was just such a profound statement. I thought that's true, you know. And just gathering knowledge is one thing, but the way we work with it uh, is is extremely important. And being a rock art person, um, I have people usually the first two questions: how old is it, and what is it, and um, and many other questions that stem from that. And so I've given up on truth, and I just manage viewpoints now, and it causes me less grief. And not to say that I have a truth, don't have a truth, but, and I think we can all learn something about rock art. And, and also too, with, with rock art and like anything else, 
Renewal's not about reproducing it. Renewal to me is about having meaningful and appropriate discussion about it. So if we want to renew rock art, we need to talk about it. We don't need to lock these things away. So I was very glad that Jim put a great article in on rock art in the Barabarang. It really, it, we need to talk about these things. You know, and that's what's happened with my work in the Wollamai, that we take things and we produce things, but we do things with them. We give them our elders, we bring them into the, to the Wollamai if we can. We're lucky we can fly them in sometimes. And they go back to their communities and have discussions and then it comes back to us again and we have more discussion. And I think this is a very, very important process for us all to be engaged in. And I mean that, all of us to be engaged in, appropriately. <coughs> so gaining knowledge and, um, and wisdom, and I have a few thoughts on this, and this is very interesting, because not long after Eugene sort of, I he gave me this book and I read it, and it just really affected me. And I was sitting in an airport in Dallas, I'd been doing some work with the Native Americans over there, and I was sitting there as this guy who happened to be a neuroscientist, his name was Steve Hall, and he started to, to talk about uh, things. And, and so what I've, I've drafted out of this discussion, and from what Eugene has presented to me, and in some way, this is the embodiment of Eugene, and then I've sort of come together with these eight pillars of wisdom. So it's a bit of a combination between Wayne Brennan, Steve Hall, and, and um, Eugene Stockton. So there, I'm already doing what I said. We, we're having discussion about this. The first one is emotional regulation. Value relationships, don't dwell on the negative. Therefore, you will rebound much more quickly. And in some way, we, we, can, we can focus on the atrocities that happened here in this country. But we need to get over it and we need to not talk about it but we need to move on from that and our divisions are only what we make them and if we work together then we're going to have much more value in what we do and in relationships for me relationship is important i, I work with you build relationship you develop respect and you meet your responsibility so i've tried to have that ethos in all my work and I think it's central to what we're trying to create here um, with this great research group that we have up here in the mountains. You are responsible for soothing your anxiety, no one else. The second pillar is compassion. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is a bit difficult because you've really got to coordinate different parts of the brain and you're almost moving towards being empathetic and having an understanding of the situation. When you're working with cultural heritage, you need to be empathetic. You need to actually have a broader understanding of different viewpoints. And you need to be able to work with those. Okay. Moral judgment. Now, this is a tricky one. And that's really connected to your core values and belief and actions. So, you know, dissonance usually occurs from your core values and your behaviours not marrying up. So if we, if we believe in something and we're not acting it out, then we've got problems. And I think that reading the stuff that Eugene gave me and having discussions with me, it was very, very important to, to understand those, those connections and, and how my conscious uh, uh, brain and my unconscious brain can work or not work in this particular case. And understand the real value of shadow. Um, a fourth pillar is humility embodied in this man here that um, so much humility, so much knowledge, but yet humility. And that really sticks out. And, and I, I sort of summarise that it's a combination of intense professional will and extreme personal humility are the essential traits for being a great leader rather than having personal drama. Altruism. It's another word that gets interpreted in quite many different ways, but I, I put it here as to sacrifice personal gain to deal with or meet your responsibility to your law, both L-O-R-E and L-A-W. Patience. You have a lot of patience with this book, I'm sure, and then Kel too. <clears throat> it's a sense of imagination of the future, a capacity which resides in the prefrontal lobal cortex helps suppress the immediate gratification and helps people plan goals 
and remain optimistic about the future. And this is what we need to do. With all the horrible stuff that's going on in our lives and in the Baragarang, which is sort of repeating history, isn't it? We need to be clear about what we need to do. And so having us united is going to be much more beneficial than divided. And this is what governments do with policy. And this is what communities can do with ego. And the archaeological world, too, is very interesting. Uh, I think the world of archaeology actually should... Um, <laughs> the, the ego should be a banned sub substance, actually. <laughs> Anyhow, that's another story. <clears throat> and then, of course, um, there's sound judgment. That's decision-making. How do we decide what is important in our lives? What is important in our lives? <clears throat> and then the, the last thing is dealing with uncertainty. Now, habit allows us to act quickly um, when the world is, 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 is unchanging. But we live in a very big changing world now. But when we experience great change, habit then slows down our ability to react. Therefore, the answer can be found in ritual, which helps us deal with uncertainty. And it also helps us go to the edges of our known reality. So those pillars of wisdom to me are very, very important in the way I live my life. Eugene has helped me formulate lots of things and how I think about archaeology, how I think about not just my work, but about who I am and how I carry myself. One of my mentors said to me, Tex Guthorpe, he said, it's, it's not who you think you are, it's the way you carry yourself, the way you unpack things. And I would hope that we can learn how to, how to unpack cultural heritage and spirit in this country where we live in the appropriate way. And what's the appropriate way? Well, we can ask, we can ask questions, and we can have discussions about that. But from the heart, and from truth. And I don't see too much truth in this world today, but I see this man here who has nurtured my thinking, who has nurtured this community in a pretty special way. So Eugene, I want to dedicate this book to the work, to the empathy, to the compassion, to the humility that you've shown to me and many, and many others, and I'm sure there are lots of people in this audience that would have a similar Eugene story. And I love this man deeply. May the spirit wind be your friend, Eugene. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Can you feel it? There's a spirit in this room. There's a spirit here. Um, and Wayne, your words have just set it off for us uh, in a really tangible kind of way. Um, while Wayne was speaking about compassion, and, and it's the major theme of the present Dalai Lama, but uh, my field of study is uh, the ancient Hebrew scriptures. And the Hebrew word for Compassion is rahamim, which actually means womb. And the poetry behind it is the womb-like protection and warmth that one can extend to another is the spirit of compassion. Um, and you realise that words like this, as in, as in so much of the uh, indigenous languages and indigenous references to nature, you find a deep poetry there that says more than just a description or a scientific formula. It's, it's something from the heart and something that wells up from the spirit. I'd just like to mention the fact that we have some local representatives here that are notable folks. We've got um, uh, Romola Hollywood and, uh, representing the mayor and Brent Hoare, um, and also Trish Doyle, who is our local state member. Um, 
And we're kind of thinking that um, this labour thing will continue after this month. <laughs> I was just reminded of two senior gents who were having a, a yarn, sitting on the veranda having a yarn, you see, and one said to his mate, do you feel like going for a walk? And the other one said, it's windy, isn't it? And his mate said, no, it's Thursday. He said, so am I, let's go and get a drink. <laughs> so I'd invite Trish to come forward and address us, say a few words for us, Trish. It's humbling to be here, actually, um, um, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, there absolutely is a spirit um, in this room and, and amongst us, so it's 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 quite incredible to be a part of today's launch. Uh, I know that uh, just from the weight. <laughs> <laughs> that there's been an incredible amount of work, but the few words that I wanted to um, share with people here today um, is the critical importance um, of us recording Aboriginal heritage of the Blue Mountains, um, not only in the current political climate, um, but that we actually do have a tomb to share with our young people. Um, I'd love to see uh, a bit of a travelling road show around to a number of schools um, with, this, with this book um, and to tell some stories um, and to weave the stories of the past and the critical importance of our Aboriginal heritage in the Blue Mountains in with today's issues and the importance of young people um, joining us on that journey in talking of history and knowing our history and loving our history and more importantly than everything um, for me at the moment is understanding the word protection, protecting our history and our heritage. Uh, so thank you uh, to you all for pulling together um, your big brains, incredible amount of energy into this um, fabulous piece. It's, it's an absolute honour to be the member for the Blue Mountains. Um, I look forward to talking about this in the Parliament um, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd just like to draw your attention to a couple of features. The, the subheading in this book is recent research and reflections and you'll find when you read through and I, and I don't suggest you read it all at once it's too much all at once each chapter is such a gem it needs to be given its own time and space but a feature of the book is at the end of every chapter there is a, a reflection by the author and that is pure gold at the end of every chapter the reflection is pure gold so it's not just throwing a whole lot of information out or a bunch of facts. It's actually answering the so what question. What can I do about this? How will this affect me? What sort of impact will this have on my thinking, my attitudes, my life in general, and my own personal growth process? And I see that as a really um, outstanding feature of this book. Um, I think there's so much we can learn from our First Peoples uh, in this country about care for the land and reverence for sky and earth and rock, plant, waterway and everything else and living things. Um, I sometimes wonder if young folks who spend a lot of their free time on their screens will ever get to put their feet in the dirt and feel the land. And, and look up into a tree. Um, I was taking my dog for a walk yesterday, and we, it's always a bushwork at the back of our place, and a female lyrebird just jumped out of our way and hopped up into a tree. And I thought, this is marvellous. You don't see that every day, and you don't see it on your screens, and you don't see it in your car. 
You have to, as, as, as Michael Jackson said in the last chapter here, you have to walk country to know country. You have to actually get your body in it to appreciate it. Um, I'd, I'd like, to, um, like to invite Jim to come forward um, and just to... Um, Jim's got three chapters in this book um, and like all the other chapters, wonderful stuff, valuable. Um, to speak to us just for a minute and introduce Graham. Thank you, Jim. If my voice sounds a little different, I have stitches in my lip and face. I might need a little bit more than that one minute. <laughs> the land of Gundamba speaking people is huge and diverse. Parts of it were occupied by different subgroups or bands who looked after their local country and stories. The largest and most powerful and warlike of these subgroups were the Barabara. They were true mountain people living in the high rugged country around the Great Dividing Range. The Barabaras were renowned warriors, storytellers, healers, song men and song women, and ceremonial leaders. Most of the wonderful creation stories we have about um, the dreaming, uh, the early uh, prehistory of the mountains comes from Barra Barra people. In historic times, the leader of the Barra Barra was called Murrindar. Some of his descendants are here today. And by the way, these are the only descendants of Gundungra people who've kept their Gundungra name down through the generations. Some white man decided that it was easier to spell Miranda than Miranda, but uh, they kept that name uh, from the earliest times. Every other Gundungra descendant have the surnames of white people. Imagine the life of Miranda, born about the time invaders arrived in Sydney Cove. He grew up hearing stories about the strange white people. It was initiated at about the time Burra Burra country was invaded via Cox's Road from 1815. He joined with the Bathurst people to fight these settlers. Most of this resistance was crushed by the martial law period of 1824-25. But Murrida kept killing white people for eight more years after the Bathurst people had been pacified. He also speared Aboriginal people who tried to take advantage of the breakdown of traditional life by moving into Burra Burra country. Murrida was an enforcer of Aboriginal law. And it's interesting that one of his descendants, Graham, also had a career in law enforcement. It's true in many cultures that those who live by the sword can die by the sword, and Murrindar was killed not by white man or the traditional enemies of the Burra Burra, but by someone from his own group who was jealous of his power and authority. Murrindar was not allowed to rest in peace. His grave and the grave of one of his wives was dug up and their possessions stolen. These are now in museums that are resisting attempts by Marandar's descendants to return the stolen property so that it can be reburied. The descendants of Marandar and other Burra Burra families have now joined together to form the Burra Burra Aboriginal Corporation. The descendants of Burra Burra have inherited his fighting spirit. These modern day warriors, and dare I say enforcers, will become a powerful voice for Aboriginal people in the years to come. To tell you more about the Burra Burra Corporation, uh, let's invite Graham Miranda. Now make that Graham Miranda uh, up to tell us about uh, what his group is doing. And by the way, Graham has an uncanny resemblance to old Miranda. If you have a look at my book, The Aboriginal People of the Burra Green Valley, there's a painting of Miranda spitting image of this guy here. He's even grown the same beard that Marinda had <laughs> since I last saw him. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Jim. I wasn't expecting uh, Jim to ask me to talk about the borough boroughs, but I did have a sort of hint, so I did type up a, uh, uh, just put the, the aims of our corporation out, and I'll just read those aims. 
um, for everyone. Uh, the aims, we've got seven aims. Aim one is to sustain awareness of the Burra Burra people. Aim two, to conduct, assist in research concerning past and present descendants of the Burra Burra. To instigate and or assist in research recording of traditional Burra Burra country. Number four is what I'm here for today. That is to support, promote research by others concerning the Burra Burra people and country. Uh, five, to recognise and endorse descendants of the Burra Burra as Indigenous. Six, to instigate and or assist in the return of ancestral remains for burial in Burra Burra traditional country. Seven, to instigate and or assist in the return of sacred and or traditional items of Burra Burra ancestors to a safe keeping place. That's our aims and uh, we're only new, we're only young and we've got other younger people from uh, our uh, families involved so we hope that that will only build and build and build. Now back to the, what I came before. Uh, good afternoon all. I'm a Gnungra man from the Burra Burra clan and as you've heard uh, Jim talk, we, we, we covered the, what I see is the southwestern Hulu Mountains area. I'm extremely proud to be here today to launch the book, Aboriginal Heritage of Blue Mountains, Recent Research and Reflections, published by the Blue Mountain, now yes, Mountain, <laughs> Education and Research Trust. It is a rich and rewarding collaboration, edited by Kelvin Knox and Eugene Stockton. The book will ask you to consider archaeological matters such as percentage data, sequences, radiocarbon dating, geometric microliths, <laughs> stratigraphic variations, differential vertical displacement. <laughs> but I jest, I jest. It's an understandable and informative read, it really is. The authors touch on the ethics of heritage. They also, also explain that archaeology now involves Aboriginal people as well as including their particular world view. You hear about campsites, sacred places, tour work sites, sandstone rock shelters, open campsites, portable grindstones, engraved rock art, pigmented rock art, stone arrangements, portable transported stone, axe grinding groove sites, tool making, hammer stones, church flakes, song lines and much more. The chapters provide a banquet of sketches, photographs and maps. The book draws together Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people for the common purpose of caring for country. It compels you and me to connect with country to, for untold benefits and understanding. Here I would like to use my daughter's words which are, this book is a valued voice in the call to treasure and protect these places for generations to come. They, the authors, have illuminated quiet places to reveal rich evidence of life and livelihood. Ladies and gentlemen, I give the authors Kelvin Knox, Eugene Stockton, Grace Carskins, Michael Jackson, Bruce Cameron, Jim Smith, Wayne Brennan, and Evan Gallard. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, we're calling it a book. It's much more than a book. Uh, it's a treasury. And you'll see that when you open it. 
The middle chapters deal with a number of fascinating details, the product of research and archaeological digging. Um, none of it is technical, so technical that it's out of reach. So, um, I mean, Graham made that point. There's a lot of technical words in it, I suppose, but it is engaging and it is accessible. Um, the beginning and the end of the book contain two articles by Kell, which are kind of, I see them as bookend articles, looking at Aboriginal habitation in general in this part of the world, in the Blue Mountains, and then a kind of, well, how do you reflect on that? How do you respect that? How do you keep it alive in spirit? Um, and then finally, um, the, the final chapter by Michael on uh, the only way to know country is to walk country, as we've spoken of it a moment ago. Um, and I think that, that serves to bring us into a deeper appreciation of those people for whom oneness with this environment was essential to life um, and, and fullness and growth as human beings. And we can sometimes forget about societies that came together, that families that had their children, that taught their children, that generations moved on. There's a whole existence that this land nurtured over some time. And that deep respect comes through in the reflections, as I mentioned before, and in the very way the authors express their craft because it's not just a scientific piece, it is so much a spirit piece. Finally, I'd just like to mention this, and you'll appreciate this when you come to it. The layout of this book is just magic, absolute magic. And that's down to the work of Alan Walsh, the Secretary of the, the Blue Mountain um, Education and Research Trust, is Alan. Alan is a printer from way back, but his professionalism is just so clearly coming through in this work. And like um, Blue Mountain Dreaming, I think it'll become a classic. So in, in concluding, I'd like to um, put a little plug in for the, the publications of the Trust, which are out down the back there and open for sale. Um, but just before we leave this place, and as we leave it, I guess we'll leave some of our spirit behind too, just as other peoples have left their spirit behind in this environment. Um, and certainly recommend the book to your reading and um, encourage you to live through the reading of the book so that it does become a, a part of your own spirit, a, a kind of a so what, so what can I gain from this? How can the, um, the white man, the white woman, if you like, benefit from the heritage. And that's spelt out in the book. And I, I, you know, I, I urge you to um, just reflect on that. There's, there's a lot of meditation in this book. So thank you for being here this afternoon, and I wish you well, and God bless. Yeah.